It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to another episode of Science on Top. This is episode 352 and today is Wednesday the 4th of March 2020. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hey. Remember, we can only do this show thanks to the generous donations of our Patreon supporters. Check out scienceontop.com slash donate to chip in and help us keep the show going. And let's begin, Penny, with kind of a cute little story. Can you tell us how and why would you hug a jellyfish? I personally (laughs) would never hug a jellyfish. Never Um, hug at a jellyfish. I don't know. Sorry. (laughs) But I want to start this story with just what may be seeming like an irrelevant tangent, but I promise you it's going somewhere. So I teach in primary school sometimes, and one of the things we did was with grade twos, we looked at an eye dissection. They were learning about sight and the senses. And, we, you know, I dissected the eye as a demonstration. They all came up and had a look at it, and they wanted to look at their lens. And every Did you say grade thing, twos? Grade two, yeah. So okay. they didn't do the dissection. Like I did the Right, right, yeah. I was thinking, wasn't just, that like year seven or something? I, yeah. No, no, no. That's year nine, like, uh, to do it yourself. Right, right, okay, cool, 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 cool. But they were all really interested. Like little kids are so curious. They love things. So they – all put gloves on and they looked at the lens and they touched it and touched it and touched it and soon there was no more lens. Like it was just smooshed up. (laughs) Which brings me to the jellyfish. So when you want to do research on a jellyfish, you have to catch the jellyfish. But jellyfish are really, really soft. They're very gelatinous like a lens. They're um, fragile And some of them might even fall apart, you know, just being in your hand. They're very delicate things. So, you know, you think about how you might catch a sea creature like a net, you know, a suction vacuum, metal grippers. They're not great for jellyfish. Um, So even if the jellyfish can be caught without obvious physical harm, it still could be under stress. And I know we think of stress as something, you know, stress and anxiety, like something very cognitive. But it's also a very physiological response, like it's a response when your body is in danger or, you know, something bad is happening. So jellyfish that are caught, for example, with a metal claw could be quite stressed, which could also affect the way that, you know, they show up in research and what they're doing in research. Um, So this robot is called an ultra-gentle robot. And it's got fingers that look like almost like glowing green strands of pasta. Um, so, it's, <laughs> so it's been designed to catch the jellyfish but minimise the stress. So it's physically softer than a lot of um, traditional collection devices while still being robust enough to go, you know, thousands of metres underneath the ocean but also – it will hopefully stress them less than um, traditional collections. So what it, do, it does seem to, and the way they tested this is because it's interesting because how do you know what a jellyfish is feeling? You know, they don't have a brain. I don't even know if they have ganglia, which are like little aggregations of nerves. Like I think they they may just have a neural net. So they're very Five simple mind. nervous system. Yeah, well, each individual one. But they looked at which genes were being expressed when they were caught. So with um, moon jellyfish, and this is called a transcriptome. So you've obviously got all these different genes, but they're not all being expressed all the time. So what they found is that some genes that were associated with the prevention of cell death, so stressing kind of genes, were activated when they were caught with a metal claw but not with the softer claw. So Hmm. what that seems to suggest is it is less um, stressful for them. So we're not talking about pain, 
we don't even know if they can experience pain. Um, they don't have any centralized um, nervous system, but they do have this, this neural net. So we don't know if they can process pain or even experience some kind of consciousness. We don't know. Like, I mean, it would seem that consciousness is probably more of a continuum than we think. You know, it's not like not conscious, conscious. There's degrees of consciousness. I think we could all agree that some animals have consciousness, but jellyfish really doesn't seem to. So this is really cool. It's nice to think about low impact research methods mm. that, you know, have a less impact on the organism. It's also nice to think about robotics as a bit more about than you know, just the human servant, but, you know, doing these jobs that are too dangerous or too risky or also just doing it for an animal, not for people. Like in a way it's for people, it's for scientists who want to do research, but it's also, um, you know, taking care of other li living things. So I like the story. It, it was a bit funny, like I have to say, <laughs> you know, anything that describes a robot as noodle-fingered is something I like. But, but that's actually you know, that that noodleness is the really important part because this yeah. is like this really soft silicon soft silicon. and these little nanofibers that go throughout mm -hmm. it that help control it. So yeah, you know, we we always think of like a robot claw kind of thing, uh, but this is much more. At, I, I literally said more. it hugs the jellyfish and it really does yeah. rock around and gently. It's move and lift far it far so. more gentle it's the opposite to you know those claw games where you yeah. put the claw down like it's so not like yeah. that at all yeah <laughs> uh, i always fall uh, out just as you get it lined up just yeah funny up. that yeah almost funny like that, it's yeah. rigged yeah <laughs> <laughs> but no as you say that non-destructive element is really important and i would never have even thought of the difficulties of studying a jellyfish like that i just especially once you take something out of that high-pressure environment. It, it might sound a little cynical of me, but it, when I read that story, there was a comment by one of the researchers who said that it's kind of the holy grail to be or I think the I think you said the Mount Everest or something, um, to be able to, to study these animals without destroying them, you know, because he was talking about the capture of the animals, of these jellyfish, without destroying them. But I was thinking, yeah, but then... I mean, you get them back to the lab, you're, you're going to kill those animals. That's not – like, surely you're not just looking at them. Like, you know what I mean? It just seemed a little like yeah. at least we can get them to the lab fully intact before we <laughs> kill them. It, it, well, it's not necessarily. It might sound a little bit cynical, but no, I'm sure. I mean, there might be a few things they can do, you know, behavioural sort of stuff. Um, or even, you know, you could still uh, do a genome sequence of them by just taking off a tiny – part of them it doesn't kill them necessarily yeah we'll just but it would still stress them out by doing that <laughs> as i said maybe sounds cynical of me but that was that was <laughs> the first thing that occurred to me is like at least we can get them to the lab fully intact before yeah. we rip them apart <laughs> <laughs> before we give them to penny's grade two students to right. dissect <laughs> to jab them in the eye yes <laughs> yeah. all right anywho I'll it's very interesting, and uh, like I said, the, the technology thing I think is the real important part of there, that soft gentleness, uh, sort of different approach to robotics. Very cool. Yes. Okay, Lucas, so we've talked on the show before about the growing problem of space junk, the human-made debris orbiting the Earth from old or broken satellites, launch stages of rockets, and even garbage bags jettisoned from the now deorbited Mir space station. But there may be a new approach to dealing with old and broken down satellites after a successful test in space of the MEV-1. What's that? This is so, so cool. <laughs> um, the, so I, don't, I think a lot of people don't realise that when it comes to satellites, which we've had satellite technology going for decades now, we've been using it for weather and for telecommunications and, and all sorts of different science things. Um, I don't think people realise that once they're up there, they're on their own. Um, the, the, generally speaking, and there's a couple of exceptions over, over the years where there have been some repair missions to certain satellites, 
it's very, very rare for that to occur just because the cost is extreme to put anything into orbit. Um, so if it's not something like, well, for example, the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, which had a few servicing missions, generally speaking, it's a fire and forget sort of thing. It's up there. It's got to do its thing. And if it dies, well, it's dead. There's nothing we'll send to do another one up. <laughs> send another one up. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, you, you many people have heard about this this crowded sky situation that we're dealing with. There's only really so many orbits that we can use and and to track everything that is up there to make sure that it doesn't collide with something else that is up there is quite a mammoth task. Now, with um, with telecommunications satellites and also uh, certain weather satellites, it's very common them to, for, for the uh, operators to use what's called a geostationary orbit because you need them to stay uh, or appear to stay in one place over the ground. So say, for example, you've got satellite television, um, you would tend to have a satellite dish that's pointing uh, for, you know, here in Australia, it would be pointing to, to the north, pretty much almost parallel with the horizon because the geostationary satellites are basically parked above the equator. Um, and those satellites are at a very specific orbit that, that means that the, the speed at which they fall um, in, around the, the Earth's gravitational um, uh, well just happens to coincide with the rotation uh, period of the Earth. So effectively, they, they appear to be in one place just above the Earth, but they're actually just rotating. They're in orbit rotating around the Earth at exactly the same speed as the Earth is rotating. Does that make sense? Yeah, they stay in the one spot relative to a point on the ground sort of thing. Yes, yes. And that's just a, a, um, a byproduct of where they're parked in orbit and the distance they are from Earth. Now, it's it's... As a result of this, because it's, it's a very specific distance away from Earth, um, you, you can't park too many things out there. It's around 300 kilometers above Earth, um, and there's not much you can, you know, it, it gets a, a, it becomes quite a crowded place. So when these satellites are nearing end of life, um, what the operators tend to do is they use the last bit of fuel that's in these satellites to raise their orbit into what is known as the geo graveyard, which is just a, a whole region of space um, uh, above this this uh, geosynchronous uh, area. Um, they just push it up. You know, uh, I can't remember exactly what it is, a few few hundred kilometers or something or other above it. Three hundred, and then yeah. Something like that, and so once they put them in that geo graveyard, it's it's like, well, okay, that's going to be there forever from this point forward. Mm. Now, I mean, that's a problem, and that's hopefully something that we'll we'll deal with at a later at a later time. We haven't we haven't got a solution for that just yet, but what they've done with this particular MEV, which stands for Mission Extension Vehicle, is they've got effectively a tugboat in orbit. This is a in itself, it's a it's a little satellite um, that they launched up for the express purpose of extending the missions of other satellites that are nearing end of life. So what they've done in this case is they've extended the uh, uh, existing 19-year mission of a satellite called Intelsat 901, uh, which is a, a basically a TV and communication satellite. It's been up there for 19 years, and in February it moved. It was moved up into that uh, geo graveyard um, because it was end of life. So they send up MEV one, and it, it took quite some time, a, a, f a couple of months, I believe, to get into the right orbit and to get to the right place. But then once it got to where it needed to be, it was able to then um, basically uh, match its orbit with this other satellite and then dock with it. Basically, it has it's all a fully autonomous system where it, it approaches it from behind and just very, very slowly comes up behind the satellite. And basically, I'm using my hands in the air, you can't see them. <laughs> it comes up behind it and sort of grapples on them like fingers closing over the uh, rocket uh, nozzle, the, the thruster nozzle of, uh, of, this, of the existing satellite. Does it have and soft, once it's... noodly like fingers that it hugs the spacecraft <laughs> no, with? <laughs> not at all. No, <laughs> not at all. So um, once it, it grabs onto it, it then effectively, the two of them become one. And this tugboat effectively, this MEV-1, then is uh, tasked with extending the mission 
of this telecommunication satellite by another five years by basically becoming its maneuvering vehicle. So it will now make you know maintain the orbit of this satellite. So it moved it back down to the geosynchronous space that it needed to be in, and it will stay there for five years and keep it in that position so that the satellite can keep doing its job. And then at the end of that five years, it will take the, that satellite back up to the geo uh, graveyard. It will leave it there, and then it will come and go to the next customer. This is freaking awesome. <laughs> it's basically, okay, who, who's the next one that needs uh, a tug? And it will go and, and dock with that and, and do whatever it's got to do to keep that operating for whatever period of time. So this is the first of probably many that will occur here and effectively a burgeoning industry where Northrop Grumman's you know, fleet of tugboats, if you like, will be up there that can move other satellites around and extend their missions. But not only that, they're talking about the next phase of this technology being repair missions as well. So imagine satellites that have got some kind of basic tool set on them that they're able to use AI and other autonomous programming to, to affect certain repairs on satellites, maybe refuel satellites in the in the future, and beyond that, even potentially, they're talking about um, how this might be utilised to assist manned missions with certain things as well. It's just very cool, and and I think it's it's really the next step in our evolution of satellite technology. It's it's, it's mind blowing. What worries me though is, aren't you then just delaying the problem because then don't you have eventually this is going to have an end of life these um, mission extension vehicles and everything's just going to end up going up into the graveyard again and you're going to have twice as many satellites up there well no because if you think what would happen with this satellite is they would have to send a replacement up Hmm. so once they send up a replacement, it then has got the same problem that's got to be sent to a graveyard later on. So if they yeah, can extend true. missions, because remembering, you know, launching anything is very, very expensive, uh, expensive. Launching fuel is a part of that expense. So if you can send satellites up with less fuel, but expect that their lifetime can be, you know, potentially double what uh, their fuel will allow because you've got this service of these fleet of satellites that can then service multiple satellites in their lifetime, mm. then you're not not uh, just simply replacing it with the, with the same number of satellites. You're actually reducing it by factors, depending on how many missions each one of these tugboats can do. Sure. And it also means that if we have malfunction satellites that are unable to remove themselves from hmm. geo or from whatever the orbit is, once their their mission is finished, they need to get out of the orbit. If they can't do that, then there's now a way that we can deal with that, depending on the orbit that they're in. So that's also very cool. I was uh, just reading up before about space debris and space junk and that. And the oldest uh, piece of man-made space object still in orbit is the Vanguard 1, which was launched in 1958. And that's expected to remain in orbit for 240 years. <laughs> that's and ridiculous. How long, will, how long will it be doing something useful? I don't think it's middle. doing anything useful. I think 1958, it was sent up there to go beep, like Sputnik kind of thing. It's right. not really yes. okay. a thing. But that was more just an illustration of the problem that we have with just sending stuff yeah. up and just leaving it there for something else to crash into. Yeah, and and there are um, there are animations online you can you can Google and find that that show these the orbit the cloud of things that are orbiting the Earth and. It's a stunning amount yeah. of stuff, and it's not just satellites. It's all sorts of rocket boosters and and even you know dropped tools from from manned yeah. space missions. There's all sorts of stuff that's orbiting, and at the moment, all of that stuff is being tracked. They need to know everything that's really larger than the fraction of the size of a pea. They need to know where that is so that they can avoid it and move satellites out of their out of its way and manned missions out of the, out of, out of these things way if they're coming nearby. So, um, yeah, it's a big problem that we've got to solve. And I think eventually the, the, the obvious extension to this will be eventually we'll get to a point that we can deorbit satellites using mm. this sort of stuff, using this sort of technology. Because often the, the issue simply is that they didn't 
um, have any plan other than throwing it into a, a further out orbit. They didn't have any plan to bring it back down to Earth. Well, if you've got tugboats, or, you know, this type of thing that are satellites out there that you can use for these types of missions, then potentially we could have these tugboats to move them into a decaying orbit so that they gradually actually fall back to Earth and burn up on re-entry. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know why we don't do that anyway. I mean, at what point did we start going, uh, maybe we'll stop just leaving them up in the graveyard. Maybe we should start throwing them back at Earth. You know, it just seems the most logical thing to do. It, a lot of it just comes down to fuel, right? Because mm. some of these orbits are so far out. You know, they're very, very large orbits depending on what's going on. And um, geosynchronous orbits are quite far out. That's um, the amount of fuel that would be required to bring the satellite back into a decaying orbit because there's a whole lot of... Um, there's, there's a whole lot of differences in velocity involved as well because if your velocity is too high and you bring it back towards Earth, rather than moving into a decaying orbit, you can end up slingshotting it into a very elliptical orbit instead just because of the interplay between the, the velocity and the gravity well. So if you do that, you can end up in an unstable orbit where the damn thing might become unpredictable. Hmm. So you end up having to break these things, slow them down as a part of deorbiting them. So there's a lot of fuel involved. And that's really, I think, the, the main technological issue in the past has been if you're going to plan to deorbit, you need to send up a whole lot of fuel in addition to the mission fuel just for the purpose of deorbiting. And in the past, there hasn't really been international laws that have governed this. So it's a case of, oh, just throw it out into a wider orbit. It's a problem for tomorrow. Yeah, that old method of thinking. Yeah, you know, like climate change, stuff like that. But funnily enough, we're in... Just about everything. Now, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll see what happens. But that's an exciting test of, uh, as you say, a really cool technology. Mm. And, and one that I didn't realise we were at this point. This story snuck up on me. I didn't, I didn't expect that we were, were at this point. It's very cool. Penny, let's move on to the next story. And I'm at a bit of a loss with this one. <laughs> Somehow, or for some reason, people are hooking sensors up to plants and translating the electrical conductivity of the plants into, quote, music. And I have no idea why, but it sounds like hippies. It does sound like hippies. But maybe like anything that breaks the kind of, you know, structures that we expect music to go to it does sound a bit hippie and a bit out there. Who knows? I'm sure we all have our musical cultures. But um, what's interesting, though, is that what this technology does is it, it takes um, some of the electrical signals off a plant's leaves so the you know the the transmission I'm not 100% sure but um like measuring the resistance between different points of the plant mm -hmm. and it changes that into music so it's basically getting a stream of information from the plant so and these resistance varies depends on how much water is in between the two points. So just say you put it at two points on a leaf. So how much water is there? So is the plant photosynthesizing mm -hmm. and the moving water around? So plants have these um, vein-like structures called xylem where they move water through the plant. So that change in the amount of water leads to a change in the electrical resistance, which can be graphed as a wave and then translate it into a pitch. So as music goes, that would probably be pretty blah, but then there's some software that then adds different instruments and so on for the plant to quote unquote play. And there's also a bit of modification to get it to be harmonious. So there are enough rules imposed on it to make it sound recognizably like music albeit weird music um but it's it's not it's definitely not like you know a plant's inner life i think what's really important to remember is that the musical aspect of it is generated by humans so plants are not yep. making their own natural <laughs> natural music um it is humans turning information from a plant into sure. music yeah which Fine, like why not? Like I've been, I've got a few house plants which I'm very fond of. I've also got a few that 
sadly are no longer with us. Um, <laughs> you know, and I they guess went the way of the eyeball. They <laughs> did go the way of the eyeball. In fact, one of the plants that's still with me has a few scars from having pencils curiously poked through its leaves. But anyway, I didn't do that, by the way. <laughs> Experimentation is an important it, it, aspect of a young of budding scientist's uh, sure. development. Anyway, yeah. what will happen if I drop the plant on the ground? Oh, yes. Anyway. Mum will get angry. <laughs> yes, mummy gets angry. Um, <laughs> anyway, so why did I even want to talk about this? Because it's sort of weird, but I did think it was interesting because plants are really alien if you think about it. And I don't often think about plants. Like, you know, they are as alive as me or you. They are definitely living things. But, you know, I was talking before about jellyfish and how we don't know if they have consciousness. They have a nervous system, but it's not like ours. Well, plants don't even have a nervous system. They don't have that kind of quick response that animals do to the environment. But what this does is it's just presenting information from a plant in a different way and it can help you in a way to get maybe get a bit closer to your plants so when I look at my plants I can see if they're wilting or if their leaves are changing color and so on when you listen to the plant music the music does change in response to what's going on with the plant Now, it's not that the plant is trying to communicate to us. It's not that it will grow better if you play it heavy metal or whatever. (laughs) But, you know, if it's low on water, that resistance is going to change. Uh, The time of day, the amount of light, the amount of oxygen in the room, um, movements in the room will all change that pattern. So we can get messages from this so-called plant music. Like to me it sounded, like Ed said, like very hippie, very out there, like, I think I said before the show, it sounds like if you've ever heard of that binaural beats music that's meant to help you study and focus, um, it's kind of, for, to me, it sound my untrained ear, it sounds very formless but still harmonious but it doesn't seem to be going anywhere, you know, there's no verse, there's no chorus. Well, should, just, we, should we have a listen to some? Yeah, let's have a listen. I'm going with hippies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just liked it. I just liked thinking about this. It's anything that helps you think about the world from a different perspective. I do enjoy. And we've often thought about how we can communicate with plants, how we can affect plants and so on. And we don't often think about the effects that plants have on us. Um, sure. Sure. I like it from the point of view, as you say, of like a remote monitoring kind of thing. If you're on Mm. holidays, whatever, you can have these sensors hooked up to your plants and you can tell if they're doing well, if they're thriving, if they need watering and, you know, your neighbour hasn't been around to water them or something like you told them to. Things like that I can sort of see are useful. It's just the whole converting it into music just sounds a bit (laughs) meh to me. Yeah, I don't know. It helps you think in a different way. Like sure. I think that, you know, art and music are definitely ways that humans engage with our world. And it's true. Yeah, music from a plant. I might not listen to it per se, probably won't be number one on my Spotify playlist, <laughs> but it is something that it does make you think. Like, yeah, what is this? What does it mean to be a plant? It's, just, it's different. I like something that has a really different perspective and you never know where that will leave. So it's not just monitoring a plant, but tuning in to a different kind of life. It's a little bit Ig Nobel prize to me. It is a bit Ig Nobel. It makes you laugh, ha-ha, they're making music. But then you start thinking about what that electrical signal can mean and how you can use it for other things. And it's not the first time that we've sort of done this translation of one form Mm. of data into music. And I know um, there there were people who have, like, recorded 
the magnetic fields on the sun, for example, and use that as a translation into a kind of a music and uh, different stuff like that, or the um, auroras on Saturn, for example. I think that was made into, quote, music. It is good to have different way of thinking about the raw data, I think, sometimes. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting. A different form of data visualisation. Like yeah. no one would blink twice if it was put into a graph. Why not make it into a sound? A graph for your ears. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Lucas, let's go back and talk about some space news. And we love talking about exoplanets because we now have a new way of detecting planets outside our solar system. And this one's really cool, isn't it? Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. So what are the current two ways we have for detecting planets? Is the wobble method? Well, yes, we do like the wobble method. We're more uh, scientifically known as the radial velocity method. And what is that? That's when you can detect that there is something influencing a star's uh, position in space uh, by its gravitational pull. So the effect of a planet orbiting a star will move that star slightly. And the common um, visual that's used to describe this is, is where uh, if you imagine um, ice skaters and there's, a, there's an ice skater spinning with another ice skater at arm's length and as they spin around with the ice skater at arm's length in the, in the larger orbit, they basically pull the ice skater in the middle around slightly off their axis. So they kind of wobble in the middle. And the other one? A uh, transit method where the planet orbits between us and the sun or the star that it's orbiting, and we see a slight dimming in the star's brightness. Yes. yes. So, top marks. Sorry, that was a that was a quiz without <laughs> warning too. So very well done. Uh, <laughs> just lucky you're also an astro geek, I guess. Um, so, so these two methods, um, al although we found absurd numbers of of exoplanets now using these methods, they do tend to favour more massive planets because, um, well, one of them, we need a, a planet with enough mass to exert enough of an influence over its star that it does cause it to wobble. And the other one, we need it to have enough mass and therefore size, really, to cause enough dimming as it crosses over the face of the star in front of it. The other problem with that method, the transit method, where it crosses over the face of the star, is it has to be aligned just right. So it, it basically needs to cross in between us and the star that it's, that it's circling for us to detect it in that way. Because if its axis is 90 degrees to us, for example, or really any other degree other than straight ahead, we're not going to see it because it won't dim between us. So although they've been extremely effective, um, you know, there's limitations. Now, this new method, <laughs> this new method is ridiculously cool. Um, it's, it's funnily enough, it's been theorized for quite some time, and I didn't realize that this was the case, but for quite some time it's been theorized that you should be able to detect a planet that is relatively close to its star, which in experience tend to be, well, that tends to be where the rocky planets live in, in close orbit. It's not only rocky planets. Obviously, there's hot Jupiters and stuff like that that are really close to their star. But uh, we, we have, it does seem from our observations so far, that the rocky planets probably form close to their stars. So uh, this new, this, this uh, theory has long been that if you have a sufficiently large rocky planet um, sufficiently close to its star, it should cause basically a aurora on the star itself, which is which is an interaction between the rotating body's magnetic field and that of the star itself. So picture, um, I don't know if you know anything about bicycle dynamos, sort of old school now, you don't see them much anymore, but um, the way that they work is they, they have the the wheel passing through the dynamo, so the back wheel of the bike usually passing through the dynamo, which causes the dynamo uh, wheel to spin, which then spins basically a reverse electric motor that's got copper windings on it, and that causes a magnetic field, which then results in current flowing. So it's a similar sort of effect here where you've got one magnetic field rotating in, around another magnetic field, and that causes some fairly identifiable signature events. 
So one of them is aurora, and we see this on Earth, and we do also see it in other uh, moons and planets uh, within our solar system. So a very common one, and one that's actually linked to this study, is the aurora that we see on Jupiter as a result of the interactions between Io, which is the largest, uh, sorry, the, the closest of the large moons, the Galilean moons around Jupiter, the interactions between Io and Jupiter, which are caused by these magnetic field interactions, create aurorae on Jupiter that are very really? um, uh, intense. But more importantly, it creates very intense uh, radio waves, which are which are quite specific and easy to identify. These really low frequency waves, easy to identify as coming from this source. I always just assumed they were caused the same way as Earth's aurora, which is, you know, the magnetic field from the sun. But this is from a moon. Okay. Yeah. So so in the, in the case of Earth's aurora, of course, we've got the magnetic field of the Earth interacting with the charged particles coming from the sun, the, 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 the solar radiation. So um, it's and then it ionizes certain yeah. gases that are in the atmosphere of Earth, uh, predominantly nitrogen and um, oxygen and a bit of hydrogen. And, and depending on which gas is being ionized, you get different color aurora. So in that case, it's the magnetic field of the Earth that is interacting with the solar wind. But yes, um, indeed, the, the some of the um, moons do interact with their host planets. Now, in our solar system, we've not seen any of these types of things uh, coming from our sun. And the reason for that is the distances are quite large and our sun is a medium weight star um, and our rocky planets are too far away from it. But red dwarves are a completely different matter. And red dwarves are already uh, quite a good candidate for looking for life um, for one major reason, which is they're long-lived. So if you have a stable enough environment for a long enough period of time, then that could be ideal in terms of uh, producing life because it's got long enough to, to establish itself. Now, on the other hand, though, red dwarves are also quite sort of, you know, angry little stars. Um, they throw out a lot of solar radiation, solar flares, coronal mass ejections. They've got very intense magnetic fields. But some of them are okay. And they, if, uh, you know, they have longer rotational periods and less violent. And if there was a rocky planet in their habitable zone, that Goldilocks zone that, that we've talked about many times before, then uh, it, 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 you know, certainly stands a chance of... Uh, of producing life. The problem is, how do we detect them? You know, it's really, really hard. Mm -hmm. So now uh, there has actually been a detection of a planet using exactly this technique, and it's uh, it's around a star um, very affectionately known as uh, GJ1151. Um, uh, this was uh, deemed to be a very good candidate uh, to go looking because it has quite a, a, a slow rotation period. Uh, which is once every 130 days. And because of that, it's quite a peaceful red dwarf. Um, and uh, so they went looking for this to see whether there were radio waves that were coming from this thing. There was a whole, almost a constellation of, of um, telescopes that are involved in this as well, which is, which is also really cool. So once they did their observations, they detected radio waves that they said, okay, this can really only be one of two things. This is either the types of radio waves we would expect to see with a um, rocky planet relatively close to this star, but in this case actually within quite feasibly within the, the habitable zone, uh, interacting with the magnetic field of the star, or this could be a binary companion. Now, they followed up with a series of observations using some other um, instruments and telescopes to rule out the binary companion possibility because that could have caused the, the similar radio waves and they did rule it out. And so what they've now said in the study is that this is a detection of a rocky planet, well, likely to be a rocky planet. They haven't quite confirmed the mass as yet, orbiting the star uh, every one to five days, which is pretty tight. It's quite a close, uh, close orbit to it. Mm -hmm. So this planet in itself is not likely to be a candidate for life because with an orbit that, that um, 
that fast, it's going to be quite close to the star as well, uh, which means it's quite likely tidally locked. And there's a whole lot of problems with that in terms of life, you know, getting a grip. Um, but as a proof of concept, it's a really good one because uh, a long theorized possibility for finding planets has just become real, which is, again, awesome. It's very awesome. Yeah. Uh, it's It's kind of a bit of guesswork and process of elimination in terms of well we've ruled out the one other thing that we could that we thought it might have been therefore the only other possibility that we can think of must be the sort of result i mean there's a little bit of conjecture there of course but yeah it comes of course from the modeling of okay these are the these are the frequencies this is the range of frequencies we would expect to see okay based on the modeling and the mathematics from these interactions between magnetic fields um, and we go looking for that. Oh, okay, we found that. All right, so that's there. Right. So Okay. So there's, there's a number of different um, facets and parts. Yeah, it's coming from the opposite yeah. direction of what you suggested basically. Yeah. So we expect to see this. Okay, we found it. Um, the only other thing that we – yeah, so there, of course, there could be something else that's causing it, but then As that would be something yeah. that we don't know anything about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and this is, I think it's actually a really good point that you've brought up here again, because it's good. This is something that often is lost in translation when conversing with people who aren't, who don't have a, a solid grip on, on science trying to disprove the, mm -hmm. disprove hypotheses. And that's kind of a core tenet of, of the scientific method is, okay, you, 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 you come up with a way of explaining something and you, you, you back it up with observations and, you, and you, you outline how this could be working. And then in, the, in order to test it, you try and disprove it. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what you're trying to do. So in order to have a, a sound hypothesis, you also need to be able to propose how this hypothesis would be, or hypothesis, would be disproven. And, of course, this is one of the problems with things like string theory, right, and multidimensionals and stuff like this. But how do we disprove them? Because we can't mm -hmm. step into other dimensions. So it's important that, you know, when things are proposed, you also propose how you would prove it incorrect, and then you seek to do so. And then, of course, other scientists come up and try and, um, A, repeat your experiments and, your, and, and uh, you know, confirm what you've, you've observed to be the case, but also try and find other ways of explaining it. And uh, I, I imagine this is going through that process right now in terms of all the other uh, astronomers in this field going, all right, how do we disprove this? <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and the thing is, to be, to be able to disprove another scientist's hypothesis is kind of something that they... <laughs> <laughs> they really strive for because it's it's one that can bring you some some notoriety as well and and uh, well let's face it some funding if you can do that so it depends on what the field of science is of course I mean it, this isn't exciting as tree singing there's no doubt um, but but <laughs> I'm not dissing I swear to God I'm not dissing I like trees um, <laughs> but uh, as you say, it, this is one more method of detecting exoplanets, which we sorely need because we're very, very limited with those two methods that you mentioned. And it kind of yes. reminds me of the whole gravitational waves thing. It's like, awesome. Now we have this great new tool, this new method of detecting and, and studying the universe and things. Now we have possibly a new tool or method of searching for exoplanets, which is yes, exciting to say the least. Yeah, and there's, there's one other thing I think that's also important as well is that, as I mentioned, red dwarves are very tempestuous. They do tend to throw out a lot of solar flares, charged particles, all sorts of stuff that, that, that have the effect of stripping away atmospheres of planets that are close to them. Uh, this is exactly what we think basically happened to Mars at some point in time, that because its, it's molten core basically solidified, more or less, we think, we're still confirming that, because that occurred, it lost its magnetic field. And once that happened, the, the solar radiation stripped away its atmosphere, and that basically led to its loss of its volatiles. So its water and all that sort of stuff was, was lost from its uh, atmosphere, and then it turned into the desert that it is. So that, but way more so for a, a rocky planet orbiting a red dwarf. So this, um, this approach also has the byproduct that it would only actually show up as a detection if this rocky planet had a strong magnetic field. 
and that strong magnetic field would be required to maintain an atmosphere on the planet. So not only does it help it detect it, but it also shows, well, not only have you detected a planet, you've detected a planet with a strong magnetic field, which, which is important. And therefore potentially habitable, yeah. Hmm. And I think that wraps up the show. As always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 352. And if you go to scienceontop.com slash donate, you can sign up on Patreon and help us pay the bills and keep the show going. Thanks very much, Penny and Lucas. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. And my question is, why can't we hug? It's breaking my heart. Me too, Lenny. (laughs) Everyone's doing the very best they can to stop spreading germs so as few people get sick as possible. So we know that one of the ways this virus spreads is through touching people who have it, and sometimes people can be sick and not know it yet. So if you're living in the same house as someone and they're not sick, it's okay to have hugs with them. But if you're not living in the same house as someone, that's why we're maybe just taking a break from having hugs with them for the moment. The good news is that this won't last forever. Scientists are working really hard to find a way to protect people from coronavirus, and once they do, we can go back to hugging our friends again. Hi, I am Hannah. I go to Swanbourne Primary in Perth in Western Australia. I want to know if we are all going to die. Hannah, um, I think a lot of kids are thinking that sort of thing and you can understand because the headlines are very dramatic and people are talking about this being a deadly disease. And the answer is no, everybody's not going to die. and. Let me, let me split this into two parts. Let's start with Hannah, you and your family living in Swanbourne, a wonderful part of Australia by the beach. And, you know, you've probably got brothers and maybe one or two brothers and sisters. You're all young and your parents are almost certainly young too. And in a young family like yours, nobody's going to die. Then you might say, well, why am I hearing all these stories about the deadly virus? It's just because it's very infectious. Lots of people get it. So if a million people in Australia get the infection, even though it's only 20 in 100 who end up in hospital, that's actually a lot of people. And it will overwhelm our hospitals. And a lot of people will end up in intensive care, but simply because it's a million people. But even then, it's, you know, it's not everybody, and it's far from everybody. We'll, we'll, we'll all get through this. Um, we will get through this. 